go. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. If you could please grab your seats, we're going to get started. So good to see some familiar faces, some new ones. Welcome with us this morning. Um, whether you're joining online or in person, welcome to Granville Chapel. Uh, it is such a gift to have you with us this morning, and whether you would call yourself a follower of Jesus, a seeker, uh, or a skeptic, our prayers that you might experience a little bit more of his love this morning as you're with us. So we're going to begin with a call to worship this morning. Uh, if you could all stand with me, if you are able. Uh, and kind of posture yourselves or prepare your hearts and minds and bodies to worship in whatever way you would feel comfortable. And I'd like to invite you to close your eyes and maybe just take a few deep breaths. And as you do that, just kind of let your mind settle on what it's thinking about. Become aware of your thoughts, your feelings as you come in this morning. And now just take a moment to recenter your scattered senses on God's presence with us. And now if you're comfortable, I'd invite you to just take a moment to invite in uh, the Holy Spirit afresh into your heart, into this place. And as we head into worship, uh, would you just let these words wash over you from Psalm 27? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army come at me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for gathering us here together this morning. Um, all of us who come from totally different weeks, totally different experiences, God, but we are here uh, united in you. Um, and so we just ask that as we read your word, um, as we worship you, as we come together and look at each other's faces and have community, Lord, would we just see you? Um, would these pages of scripture come alive this morning through your spirit? Um, and would it be a place that we get to meet you and encounter you this morning uh, in all these ways? Amen.
offerings. Uh, so the ushers are welcome to come forward as we begin the next song. Um, this offering supports the work of Granville Chapel and the city, this church, and Welcome again, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, how's everyone doing today? Weird question, because there's a lot of you. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs middle. This is what we do with the youth sometimes. Amazing. Some thumbs up. Good news. Um, if you are new, uh, or this is your thousandth time here, whether you're joining online or in person, it is a gift to have you with us this morning um, to worship and to just be in community. Um, so welcome here. 
If you are new and want to connect in a more intentional way, we have uh, little cards called Connect Cards that will just be out there. There's also an online version that I believe there's a QR code in your bulletin that you can scan that will take you to that. Um, and if you send in, it's just a little bit of information why you want to connect with us, and us as staff would love to connect in a more um, intentional way and get to meet you, maybe go for a coffee um, and see how you're doing. Here at Granville Chapel, we are a family gathered around being with becoming like and reflecting Jesus uh, together in Vancouver. Um, And so that looks like seeking to partner with him in all the different areas of our lives with what he's already doing um, and the healing he's bringing and the love he's bringing to this place. Um, So if you've been here for a long time uh, or are just interested in calling Granville Chapel your home, we would encourage you to jump online and check out our community groups. Um, So in our community groups is where we kind of flesh out what it looks like to follow Jesus in our daily lives. Um, Some of them share a meal, play games. Uh, We just get together and seek Jesus and seek each other. Um, So I'd encourage you to do that. That'll be on our website Um, and maybe even in the bulletins as well if you want to get more intentionally connected to our community. For those of you that are new or need a quick reminder, um, we have a nursery, so it's out my right, your left. If you go out these back doors or out this front door, it's kind of on the side um, of our uh, sanctuary here. Um, And that's for the little ones, the littlest ones. And then the little ones, preschool to grade five, are our kingdom kids. And they'll be going out a little later in the service, out here and then up the stairs with Susan. And then our junior and senior youth uh, will also be leaving. Uh, in the ser- not leaving the church. They will be leaving in the same part of the service and come out this door and they will go to their respective kind of areas. Um, so a few little announcements um, is that our first one is our Global Ministries Partner Update. So Kevin and Tanya Van Horn, uh, who are with InterVarsity and IFES, um, we have a short video. Oh, Never mind, it's our other global ministries partner, Ratnak. Um, so we'll be hearing from them and kind of the work they're doing across the world. Hi everyone, my name is Brian McConaughey and I'm the founding director of Ratnak International and we do work in Cambodia with human trafficking victims. It's a work you guys have partnered with for quite some time. That is wonderful, we thank you so much. Um, so just by way of update, um, the ministry is going really, really well. There's, there's always challenging working in this field, which is basically picking up the pieces after criminal activity that is always kind of volatile and, and fluid. Um, but to let you know that uh, as of today, when I checked, uh, we have 170 young victims in our care that have come in from trafficking and are now learning that they are to be loved by human beings and they are loved by uh, a Lord who died for them. Absolutely new after incredible trauma they've been through, not only sold into slavery and abuse, but sold into slavery and abuse in other countries. So we're able to get them back and restore those lives. What we're really working on this year too is maximizing, linking this with the local church in Cambodia. The local church in Cambodia is small, it's embryonic, it's an ex-communist country. They don't have a lot of skills, there's not many Christians in the communities, but learning to work with them, to use them as a tool of blessing once these young vulnerable lives after trafficking go back out to the village. The bar is high there, but it's really starting to kick in and we're working with with uh, little village pastors uh, who, who just, you know, they're learning as they go, but they're brave, brave, brave people. So it's absolutely wonderful to see them engaging in this whole area of trauma. Are th- is there anybody else really better suited to deal with issues of trauma than those who know the Lord. The Lord who himself suffered so much trauma. In addition to that, um, we have um, not all success. We have challenges. There's always challenges doing ministry. There's always things that, that are just, there, there's angst always when I wake up in the morning, I, I think about that. And, uh, and so one of those things is uh, really getting new staff. We've got a population in Cambodia of uh, three 
uh, percent, maximum 3% Christians. So the pool of resources to hire good, qualified, highly trained trauma care staff that are Christian that can share the Lord as well is really, really difficult. So if you could pray for us that we would get, uh, find the staff. It's really, really hard to find staff. That's our biggest limitation right now, allowing us to move ahead and expand programs that are so desperately needed. Simply finding the people and good people. So I leave that with you. Please do pray for us. Uh, it's wonderful what's happening. So many lives being changed, but it's hard, hard work. So, so do pray. Thank you so much for all your help. Amazing. If you're watching, thank you, Brian, uh, for all the work you're doing and for that video to update us. And I'd encourage all of you to take him up on that offer of prayer uh, and the invitation to pray for what they're doing out there. Really hard work, but really beautiful, beautiful things. Um, so if you're a member of Granville Chapel, we would invite you to mark your calendars uh, for our annual AGM meeting that will be happening on April 28th, uh, 2024 at 11.45 a.m. following the service. Um, and financial statements in our annual report will be sent next week uh, for your review. Um, I would like to invite Susan and Adit up for their announcement on the women's ministry. Max mentioned uh, two, two words that I remember, connecting and reflecting. And uh, so at Granville Chapel, of course, we love to connect uh, with each other. And uh, our goal is to reflect Jesus. So we have two opportunities uh, if you're a woman uh, or a, a girl to be able to do that over the next many weeks. Um, we, uh, e we are each part of a group. And um, mine is called Morningside and Adit's is Eveningside. Yes, so at evening side, we meet uh, Thursday evenings from 7 to 9, and I'm always amazed uh, when we sit uh, around the table with our Bibles open and we talk about the Word of God, we ask the Holy Spirit to touch our lives and the amazing and rich discussions that come out of that, how we enrich each other's lives by... Um, uh, convicting each other sometimes by uh, talking about challenging issues and struggles we all have and by praying for each other and connecting on a deeper level. I'm always amazed. Sometimes I don't want to go because it's uh, evening and cold and dark, but I've never regretted going because I always leave uh, enriched, inspired and uh, feel deeply connected and cared for. And at Morningside, I could say ditto to that, we, but we meet on Friday mornings at 9.30. Um, we usually have coffee with our gathering. Do you have coffee with yours? Or, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and we meet for a similar length of time, and we, we've been um, doing this in partnership. So we, we are usually uh, looking at the same studies, and we try to do about three different, two or three different studies in a year's time. So that's why we're up here today, because in a couple of weeks, we are going to be starting a new study, and it's an opportunity for new people to come on board. Um, we are going to be studying a book in the Old Testament entitled, or called, Amos. And it's through a study called An Invitation to the Good Life. And um, we invite anybody new who would like to come. We would love to have new people join us. And uh, we love to have lots of connecting. You're going to tell us about it. So um, just to pique your interest, uh, Amos is probably one of the most neglected books in the Bible. But it is an amazing um, advocacy for social justice and justice and righteousness of God. Uh, Amos was a shepherd, and he was called to the northern kingdom of Israel to prophesy against their idolatry, their selfish and indulgent living, and their neglect of the poor. Does that sound familiar? Uh, so there's many, many lessons we can learn from this book, and we are going to turn every uh, condemnation into an invitation for each one of us in 2024 to seek God and to live. One of the most uh, well-known verses in Amos is Amos 5.24. Uh, Let uh, justice flow like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. 
So we uh, will have a small, there's lots of tables in the uh, fireside room. We'll have a small table with the opportunity to register, to ask questions, or to purchase uh, the book that we're using if you'd like to join us. So that'll be after the service right through there. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, you two. Um, I'd like to invite up Sam now um, to announce something about Lady's current role. Great. Thank you, Max. And this is a short but important announcement. I just want to highlight something. Maybe if I can ask Lady to, to stand up and come forward. Um, so as you know, uh, in December, Sharon Wang was invited into the role of bookkeeper um, uh, for our church. And that takes off some of the roles that uh, Lady was uh, responsible for at that time um, in terms of the bookkeeping. And it cleared her plate. <laughs> and Mateo is coming up too. He have a little trailer. <laughs> so uh, that cleared off some of uh, uh, Lady's plate to focus on some other things. And so in line with that change and some of her expanded responsibilities and her, her, both her present as well as continuing as well as future responsibilities that we hope that she'll continue to take on, we're um, assigning her the, the role of executive administrator. <laughs> so we just want to welcome her. Uh, in that role, and congratulate her in that role, and support her in that role as she continues to do all the things um, in this office, in the office here, and that makes the, the church run smoothly in terms of all the operations, supporting the pastoral staff, supporting the lead pastor position, and all the other things that go on um, in terms of, you wouldn't be able to fathom the multiple, multiple things that go on in a week. I couldn't even list them all, the things that she does. So we just welcome her to that role. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Amazing. Uh, I just want to let you all know as the last announcement that we have a potluck actually after church today. So this is my cordial and... And yeah, just my cordial announcement that you're invited to come to it. Um, and so if you haven't brought anything, don't worry if potluck, the name scares you because you didn't bring anything, you are welcome. Um, especially if you're new here, uh, we would love to share a meal with you around the same table uh, and just be with you this morning. So you're invited to that after the service. Um, I'd like, like to invite the Kingdom kids out now, which is preschool to grade five, and they can come with Susan here out the front. So if you're preschool to grade five... Um, you can kind of exit with her. Um, and also the junior and senior high youth can kind of come out this door and go to their respective areas uh, and your leaders will be with you in a minute. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask one of the ushers outside. Um, and for the next couple minutes, literally a couple minutes, um, we're going to put a two-minute timer up. And I'd invite you guys to mingle with someone, uh, someone new around you. Um, and the question is, if you want a prompt or need a prompt, is uh, what this week made you smile? Something that made you smile this week. So you guys can kind of go into that time now.
Okay, everyone, if I can invite you back to your seats, please. Uh, if you guys really kicked it off, maybe you can make a date for the potluck and you can sit at the same table. That would be wonderful. <laughs> okay, uh, if you could get back to your seats, I'd like to invite Wayne up um, to lead us in scripture. All right, we've... we've met with each other, and now it's time to meet with the Lord together. So in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus provided a framework for prayer, commonly called the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to be following that format for our prayer together this morning. Let's all bow together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name, your character and essence is set apart from all creation. Scripture reveals, through your names, glimpses of who you are, our creator, majestic king of all the universe, provider, sustainer, the only one worthy of all our worship. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, your kingdom breaking into this world through Jesus and your redemption of all creation was your plan all along. It's what Easter is all about. Jesus' self-sacrificing love on the cross turned darkness, defeat, misery, and death into light, victory, joy, and life. May our hearts and minds become sensitive to your will so we can unite together and collaborate with all that you are already doing in building your kingdom. And we pray for the refugees we're sponsoring. Lord, have your hand in all the details to bring them safely here. Give us today our daily bread. Open our eyes so we realize how much you provide for us each day. May we live to the full in the moments you provide. May we rest in your sustaining arms. You have provided all we need to do what you would have us accomplish for your kingdom. And forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. Father, you created relationships Build up our relationship with you and help us to love others with your love. Help us to forgive with the same love and grace that you've forgiven us with. Help us turn around from the things we do to destroy the relationships we have with the world, with others, and especially with you. Lord, we come to you in a spirit of repentance, acknowledging how much we fall short, admitting that we have done things we should not have and have left undone things that we should have done. Thank you for your gift of grace and your forgiveness. Your sacrifice for us has removed our sin as far from us as east is from west. We praise you, Lord, with gratitude. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The culture in which we live offers so much powerful distraction it can often seem from our limited perspective to be a swirling storm of randomness, chaos, and purposelessness. But Lord, you reign. Keep us safe from ourselves and from the enemy of our souls. Over 2,000 years ago, you rose victorious from the grave in power and glory. Jesus, you are our hope for now and forevermore. And it is in your powerful name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 5, actually verses 1 to 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Thank you, Claire, for that wonderful reading. Let's uh, pray as we get started today, as we turn to his word. Father, thank you for scripture, and thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for his teachings. Thank you for his life. And thank you that as we turn to the teachings that he spoke in this Sermon on the Mount that we call, they give life. And so, Lord, as we turn to him, we pray that you'll open our ears and our hearts, open our lives to hear and receive what you have for us today. Amen. As a gift, my wife once booked for me a one-hour flying lesson. So on this two-seater, one-propeller plane, something like this on the screen that you see. Uh, the pilot's sitting on one side, I'm sitting on the other side, and so I have a set of controls, and the pilot has another set of controls. And I remember getting into this aircraft and taking off over uh, Boundary Bay, the, the airport at Boundary Bay in Delta, and then flying over Richmond, flying over Vancouver, over the city center, wonderful, wonderful scenic view, and then close to the North Shore Mountains, and then towards the east, out to the Fraser Valley. And then we kind of flew over this uh, flat area near Pitt Meadows, and we did some aerial kind of uh, maneuvers out there. Well, that he did anyway. And then he took us higher and higher. I saw the altitude meter go up higher and higher, this gauge, higher and higher and higher and higher. And then he shut the engine off. And then slowly, our airplane, the nose tipped downwards. We started to go into a spiral, and I could see the earth hurtling towards us, and I was afraid for my life. Literally, I was so scared. And he said, it's okay, Sam. <laughs> okay, take the stick and push downwards. And I'm thinking, push downwards, because I've been, I've been with him in this journey, because pushing downwards on the stick, you go faster instead of slowing down. He goes, yes, push downwards. And so I'm completely disoriented. The earth is hurtling towards us at uh, great speeds, and I start pushing that stick forwards, downwards. And what happened was, to my surprise, the airplane started to stabilize. And then he re-engaged the engine, and then he said, now you can pull forwards again. And then we came out of that nosedive, and started flying again. But in that instant, I was completely caught by surprise because I would have thought that in order to slow down this hurtling towards the earth, you would have to pull up. You would have to slow the plane down. But in fact, what you need to stabilize a plane is to go faster because you're just spinning out of control. And so what you need counterintuitively is to actually go faster before you can actually stabilize and fly safely again. Well, the Beatitudes are a little bit like that, and the Sermon on the Mount is a little bit like that. It's completely counterintuitive, counter to what we would think in terms of our logic in this world about how to live and what is important in life. G.K. Chesterton wrote this about the Beatitudes. 
The first time you read it, it seems to turn everything upside down. The second time you read it, it seems to turn everything right side up. The first time you read it, you feel it's impossible. The second time you, you read it, you feel nothing else is possible. I think what Chesterton was trying to get at is that as you're introduced to these Beatitudes, it's very counterintuitive. It goes against the grain of what we've lived in terms of this world and this, this society and what we see around us. But as you begin to understand the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' teachings, and you get it, you understand it, then you see that there is no other way really to live. That this is the way that God has intended for us to live all along. In fact, it's not that the Beatitudes are upside down or the Sermon on the Mount is upside down, but it's we who live upside down and they are right side up. We have been disoriented and so we need to be reoriented to God's way of living. Let me just review a bit what we've talked about so far in terms of this sermon of Jesus's, this preaching of Jesus's in these uh, uh, chapters five, six, and seven of uh, Matthew. We've come to understand now that the good news, the gospel of Jesus, the center of it is that Jesus is Lord. He is King. And so the right posture for us who are followers and disciples of Jesus is one of obedience towards this King, one of following this King, one of submission of our lives and therefore faithfulness and loyalty to this King. And what we're about to embark on in this journey of looking at these teachings from our Lord and King is the largest continuous section of what Jesus teaches about how to live. So we're looking at that very first section of this sermon, which has traditionally been called the Beatitudes. So here is my outline for this morning. First, I want to look at generally just what are the Beatitudes? And I want to ask the question, what are they? And why is it important? So we have the outline in front of us. Uh, the next slide, I think. Um, well, okay. Well, you know what they are because I'm telling you. So the first thing I want to look at is just what are the Beatitudes and uh, why is it important uh, at this part of the Sermon on, Sermon on the Mount. The second thing I want to look at is the movement within the Beatitudes because sure enough, if you read the Beatitudes through from first to last, as we had read to us, what you will see is that there's this progression, there's this movement it's not static. It's not all the same. There's this movement from the beginning to the end. And I want to explore some of that movement within the Beatitudes. And finally, I want to close with an invitation for us as we think about how to live out this, um, this different way of life. Okay? So first, the Beatitudes. What exactly are they? I want to start with this word, blessed. The word blessed in the Greek can be translated as happy or fortunate. Um, that's the most generic sense in which this word in Greek uh, can be translated. Uh, perhaps one of the most memorable translations from a theologian, the Swiss theologian Karl Barth is, you lucky bum, he says, you lucky bum, those who are blessed. Um, uh, many of you know Daryl Johnson, the preacher, who's local here, and he likes to translate this word as in sync. You're in sync. You're in synchrony with the whole kingdom of God, with God's values and way of life when you are living in this way. And all of those definitions capture important elements of what this word blessed actually means biblically. I want to add one more dimension today, and that is good news. Good news, good news to those who are poor in spirit, good news to those who mourn, to the meek, to those who are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, good news to the merciful, 
to the pure and in heart, the peacemakers, good news to those who are persecuted for the sake of the kingdom. And why I say good news is an important element in this understanding of this word blessed is because this passage, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, and Isaiah chapter 61 are closely connected. Isaiah 61, let's look at that together. So this is a, a, a passage that's often read during Advent, and in fact, we have had it read out during Advent as well. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And listen to all the echoes that you will hear from the Beatitudes. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. The context of the, uh, this chapter in Isaiah chapter 61 is the exile. And Israel has been exiled to Babylon, and they're imprisoned there. But the prophet Isaiah knows that that's not the end of the story. So part of what he's doing is he's painting this picture of this new creation in which God's kingdom will arrive, and the exiles will be freed, and those who mourn will no longer be mourning. Those who are captive will now be freed and liberated. Those who are bound are freed, and those who are blind see all these promises of God. And when Jesus comes to Israel in the first century, he takes this promise onto himself. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 4, this is his very first sermon. As Jesus stands up at the synagogue, he reads Isaiah 61, and he says, Today, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's his inaugural sermon in Luke. And in Matthew, Jesus also takes on this passage in Matthew chapter 11. He quotes this passage as being integral to his ministry, to who he is. So what we see is a connection between chapter, uh, yeah, Isaiah chapter 61 and Matthew 5. That the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is saying that this has now come in him, in his person, in his ministry, in his teaching, in his healing, in his ministry to all those around him. So why are these people blessed? The poor in spirit, those who meek, those who are meek, those who mourn, those who are hunger, hungry and thirsting. Well, it's because if Jesus is king and his kingdom has come, then what is happening in God's kingdom is that all those who are on the underside of society will now have a reversal. In other words, Israel was the one who were captive. Israel were the ones who were mourning. Israel were the ones who were poor. They were needing liberation. They were needing comfort. And as Jesus, is, uh, Jesus comes, as, as God's kingdom comes, that fulfillment will now come to pass. And Jesus is saying, in my person, in my ministry, those things are now coming to pass. God's kingdom is one of justice and mercy for all those who are experiencing injustice and lack of mercy, and they're about to have their fortunes reversed. This final kingdom, which is painted by the prophets, God is now saying, is now breaking into this world through Jesus. So there are three important principles to reading the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount that I want to bring to our attention today. The first is this that the kingdom of God, which is equivalent to the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, is all about justice and mercy. Jesus knows that this world is not how it ought to be. It's not the way that God has designed for it to be. And so what God's kingdom is doing, it's righting things again. It's making things right again. 
the Sermon on the Mount, you see, it presupposes that there is a brokenness to this world. But that message of the kingdom of God is now coming into this world in Jesus. And now this kingdom is going to be made right again. The world is going to be made right again. So those who are on the underside are going to be reversed, and those who have not had will have. Those who had lack will now have, and there will be fulfillment. So in other words, justice and mercy are key to the kingdom of God. But that leads me to another question, which is something that we haven't talked about much so far, which is, well, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? Because in the first century Judaism, the kingdom, the understanding of the kingdom would have been very logical to them, would have been very tangible to them, been easy to understand because the kingdom for them was a political, economic, and religious reform. That's what they suffered under in Egypt. They were slaves. And then in Babylon, when they were slaves. And in Assyria, when they were slaves. And then also in Roman times, when although they had a measure of freedom, they still chafed under the Roman Empire in terms of religious freedom, economic freedom, and political freedom. And so they were still longing for these things to be realized, to be liberated in a sense. But what Jesus was after was a different kind of kingdom. What Jesus was after was not the establishment of a political and geographical reform, but a spiritual reform, a reform of the human heart, of people's lives, so to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven can be, you can be anywhere at any time. You don't have to be located in a certain place or a certain culture or be tied to a certain nation. It's about following a different set of rules. So what we are, we are citizens of the kingdom, and where we go, we bring the kingdom with us. So the kingdom of God is no longer about a place as, is, as much as it is about the reign and rule of God in our lives, right? You think about the United Kingdom. What is the United Kingdom? It's a place, right? A very set political, geopolitical boundary that that's where the United Kingdom is. But God's kingdom is not like that. It's not confined to a geopolitical boundary like that. We are God's kingdom insofar as we live under God's reign. We're living to a different set of rules than those around us. So yesterday was Vaisakhi Day um, in Vancouver, and so we live on Main Street, and so we have this parade every year. Tens of thousands of people descend upon Main Street, and they celebrate and they participate in this wonderful festival uh, literally tens of thousands of people marching down main street and what they do is uh, for part of this festival is is they set up these tents these booths all along the sidewalks and they give out free food and uh, it's just part of the culture they're celebrating the the birth of sikhism actually it's a sikh festival the birth of the sikh faith and uh, i like to observe because we live on Main Street from our second story window, just looking out at this parade and the people participating in this parade. And I noticed there are three kinds of people that participate in this parade. The first kind of people are the people who are of Sikh faith, and they're just they're celebrating because this is their celebration. So they engage in all of the things, and they're, they're just having a, a fun, joyful time. The second kind of people are those who are kind of like... Um, onlookers and they come and they watch and they're enjoying the festivities as people who are not active Sikh adherents or followers but they're just enjoying and being part of the f festival but there is a third kind of group that I noticed that has come upon this parade and they follow a different set of rules 
because they're not really thinking about the parade and the festivities and the cultural things and the religious things. They're after the free food. <laughs> so I see this group of, usually it's Asian ladies, <laughs> older Asian ladies, and they've got their backpacks, they've got bags, and they've even got little um, strollers, like, like, you know, those grocery cart strollers? And they go from booth to booth, they line up, and they get their free food. And some of it you have to consume right away, but some of it, like, they give all... Now, bottles of water, bottles of pop, and bags of chips, and like that. They grab these, and then they store them. They're following a completely different set of rules. They're not there just for the festivities. They're there to grocery shop, <laughs> essentially. So, as we're thinking about the kingdom of God, it's a little bit like that, that the kingdom of God goes where we go because we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And so, now, it's not a very good example because we don't want to do that kind of a uh, different set of rules, but what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that we follow a different set of rules than the people around us. We're following God's way of life. And so our lives should look different, should look radically different because the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount really do turn things upside down. Well, this leads me to the second key principle. To understand the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, we have to understand that the external and the internal are one and the same, or they're deeply, deeply interconnected. The body and the spirit. The body what we're doing, and then the spirit, who we are as people. These are deeply, deeply interconnected. And this runs all through the Beatitudes as well as the entire Sermon on the Mount. This is what Jesus wants us to understand. It's not just about what we do, but it's actually about who we are. So remember the story from the Karate Kid? Part of the lesson that Mr. Miyagi wanted to teach Daniel LaRusso, I think, was that karate is not just a martial art. It's not just about how to learn to kick and to punch. It's not even just about how to defend yourself. It's not just about that physical action of this activity that's going on. There's something deeper. Because those other people, those bullies in the high school, also learned karate. But they used it for aggression. They used it for violence. They used it to get their own way. They used it to bully other people. But what Mr. Miyagi wanted Daniel LaRusso to understand was that karate was not just something that was physical, but it was also something that was internal. So it was about self-discipline. It was about self-control. It was about protecting others. It was about compassion. Those are the kinds of things that he wanted to instill in Daniel LaRusso in as much as the physical aspects as well. Well, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes are like that as well, especially the Beatitudes. And that's why in this beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we have Jesus not just teaching about how he wants us to behave, but really about who he wants us to be. Not just external qualities, but qualities that are internal internal as much as external. There's one more key principle to understand the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and that is that righteousness is the foundation. And today, I won't have a chance to talk about this, and I will expand on this in a couple of weeks when we touch on the law. But just understand that righteousness is one of these themes, again, that flows, is interwoven all throughout these three chapters. So, those three principles, I want you to keep them in mind. First, God's kingdom is about justice and mercy, and God's final kingdom is coming into this world, and so there's this reversal taking place. Second, body and spirit, mind and spirit and body, our actions and our heart are connected together. And third, righteousness, righteousness, the biblical understanding of righteousness is vital. Okay, what I want to do now is look at 
um, some of the progression in the Beatitudes, the movement in the Beatitudes. I want to look at how they start, how they progress, and then how they finish. We don't have time, unfortunately, to look at all the Beatitudes today, but that's something really worth studying. And the, um, the Bible study guides which have been provided do go into some depth about each of the Beatitudes. So if you download that off of our site that uh, has been provided for you, then you can look at them in more detail. Today, I want to look at especially this first one and then how it progresses towards the end. So being poor in spirit. The first beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit. In some ways, this one is the most difficult to understand because I think it is the most counterintuitive. It's like pushing that stick down when you want to pull up because who wants to be poor in spirit? Luke actually says, blessed are the poor. Who wants to be poor? Nobody, no, none of us wants to be poor or poor in spirit, but Jesus says, for theirs is a kingdom of God, for theirs is a kingdom of heaven. Now, it's important, actually, that Luke says, blessed are the poor, because it brings our attention to an important aspect of what this poverty is really about. Is it about the physical, social poverty, or is it about the spiritual poverty? So on the one hand, Luke says, blessed are the poor. On the other hand, Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, the answer is actually both or neither, because it's a little bit more complicated than that. The most helpful background for us to understand this, uh, this notion, this concept of poverty in the spirit or being poor in the spirit is actually the Old Testament. And in particular, the Psalms, which is, uses this word the most frequently out of all the books in the Old Testament, the Psalms, and which pairs this, uh, uh, this word poor with the understanding or the concept and the word for neediness. So the poor and the needy often are paired together in the Psalms. The poor and the needy. And I'll read to you one example from Psalm chapter 70, or Psalm 70. This is the Psalm of David. This is one of many, many examples in the Psalms. You can look it up yourself. Psalm 70, make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great, but I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer, O Lord. Do not delay. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. And as we look back at the narrative of the Old Testament, Who are the poor and needy in Exodus who were slaves in Egypt? Who are the poor and needy in Assyria who were slaves? Who are the poor and needy in Babylon? Again, it's Israel. God comes to the rescue of his people, not because they're so great. God chose his people, not because they're so wonderful and numerous and powerful. He came to them because... They were poor because they were needy. They were needing his rescue. That poverty in spirit. The poor are the ones whom God comes to and rescues. Those who need him. There's this theology called, that theologians talk about, called the God's preferential option for the poor in the Old Testament, and that is simply that God has special compassion on those who are poor, on those who are needy. Why? Again, it's because God's kingdom is all about justice and mercy, and this world is not how it should be. And so God has special compassion on those who are on the underbelly, who have experienced the the difficulties of the brokenness 
of this world. And so he has special compassion and mercy on them because he wants to write things up again. But it's not just a physical condition, okay? Hear this. It's not just about physical poverty, social poverty. It's about a physical condition that is tied to, and that leads to this spiritual condition so that they're one and the same. It's about the sense of needing help, needing God, that no one else can help. And so you're kind of at your wit's end. You're saying, Lord, rescue me. Who else is going to help me? Lord, you help me. It's kind of like that posture in the 12-step program, you know, that, uh, that was made famous from, uh, by Alcoholics Anonymous. The very first step is what? Recognizing your powerlessness to overcome your addiction. You're utterly powerless to this entity, this power in your life that has control over you. That is what breaks the power, that admission that you no longer have control over this area of your life. And that begins to break the power over it, over, over you. That's the sense of poverty that we're talking about, both Matthew and Luke, that we are aware of our neediness in life and we look to who else but God. I remember watching the movie Cars, one of my favorite movies, and I was reminded especially of this recently because of our trip to California and Nevada, and we actually drove along parts of Route 66, or what is, I guess now we remember as Route 66, and uh, it's, this, it's this highway that was built like all the way, I think from Chicago all the way to California before the interstate was, was, uh, was built and constructed. And now it's, there's parts of it that you know, nobody even remembers anymore, towns that completely bypassed, and it's kind of like going to a different world. And I remember going to one gas station along this Route 66, and they had these really ancient gas-filling uh, machines that is from, I don't know, the 50s or something like that. It's just from out of this, you know, out of this world, it feels like. But that's what happens in this movie, Cars. So the main character, Lightning McQueen, He's, you know, he's completely full of himself. He's this hot rod who has more talent in one lug nut than all the other cars combined, right? And he's always coming in first all the time, but he's so arrogant and so cocky, and he's pushing all his friends away, all those, even his teammates, his, his, his crew away from him because of his attitude and his fullness of himself. This is the opposite of poverty in the spirit, right? But what happens in this movie is that he gets stranded in this little town called Radiator Springs, and it's there that he begins to discover that there's more to life than just winning, than just being on top, than just being number one all the time. And it's there he begins to learn that life is not all about him, and he begins to realize the pain that he's caused others because of his attitude. And he learns his lessons so well, and, and I'm going to spoil the movie if you've not seen it, but I think I have a right to do that because it's such an old movie. <laughs> so, so he learns that lesson so well that in the very climactic scene of that movie, so he's on this ro- race, and he's... He's left Radiator Springs, and it's the final race. This is race will determine whether he is the champion of uh, the race course or not. There are three people involved in this race, himself, his arch enemy, and this old um, race car called the King. And he is winning. He's on that final lap, and he's just about to cross the finish line. But he looks in his rearview mirror, And what does he see? He sees his enemy, the arch enemy, his rival, nudge the other vehicle. And because of the way he nudged him, he spins out of control, he crashes, and he's just left on the side, half broken. And he sees that in his rearview mirror. And what he does, instead of just going through the finish line, he slams on the brakes, and just inches from that finish line, he stops. And there's a moment where he contemplates, what's his next action? 
he puts his engine in reverse and he goes all the way back to that car crash, that wreck. And what happens is bumper to bumper, he slowly pushes the king over the finish line. Meanwhile, his rival, you know, zips by him. He comes in first, king comes in second, and he comes in last. Or did he really come in last? Right? Poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. He learned that lesson so well that he was embodying it and bringing that sense of poverty in spirit and the kingdom of heaven to others, to this crash who would not otherwise have been able to finish that race. Because the ones who experience God's rescue are those who realize that they need him. The ones who experience his mercy and justice are those who are looking for him, who are looking for Jesus and know that they need him. And what happens, just as in this cartoon, is what happens in the Beatitudes is that there's this progression that not only do we experience God's mercy and God's grace and forgiveness for us, but then we can become agents of this kingdom to others. We're able to extend this blessing wherever we go to others who also need it. So that brings me to this uh, final point of this progression, that in the Beatitudes, the starting point is being poor in spirit, being empty and knowing that we need God, but the ending point is something else altogether. It's actually being peacemakers, shalom makers, who makes peace, most of all, between God and mankind. It's God himself who does it through Jesus. And so we get to participate in that kind of work, making shalom, making peace, bringing wholeness to this world. We get to take part in that as we enter into God's kingdom. And then the end of this progression actually is persecution. And that would actually make sense. It's not something that we would want to seek out after for ourselves. But it would make sense because if this world really is broken and it's operating according to a different set of values than what God wants, if we are aligned with God's values and we've got a different set of rules in our hearts and our minds, we're gonna be swimming against that current. It'll be difficult for us, it'll be challenging for us. If we're just going along with whatever the world is doing, then you would think, oh yeah, it's gonna be pleasant and you'll probably succeed where others may not in terms of being part of God's kingdom. You'll experience challenges and suffering and hardship and persecution. And that's what happened in the first century church. That's why persecution is uh, such a dominant theme all throughout the New Testament because the first century Christian church, the Christian community, was a minority. And they were living out this radical way of life in which they were giving of themselves even to the point of sacrificing their own lives. That's what persecution was about. So if we are living this life, then we should expect that there will not be, that there will be difficulties and challenges and perhaps even persecution depending on our context um, in our day. So, the progression of the Beatitudes is one from being poor in spirit to being filled by the Lord, and then one eventually taking on his role and then going against the stream of the culture and the challenges of our culture. It will be challenging. So I want to move now to an invitation. Just invite us into thinking about together and thinking about as individuals, as followers of Jesus, where you might want to or where you feel called to enter into this kingdom. So I have three questions for us to reflect on 
And then we'll give us some time and space, and I'll pray for us, and we'll continue in our worship. So the first is, what are those places in your life that help ground you, that help remind you of your deep need for God? So what are those places in your life that remind you of your need for God? And sometimes it's hard in our culture, isn't it? Because we have all our needs met, and, uh, or we think. But where are those places? Perhaps relationally, perhaps spiritually, that we have needs that remind us that we actually are not all that, that we are not finished products, but there's lack in our lives. That's the first question. The second question, what's one Christian value that's counterintuitive to you in your life right now? What's one Christian value that's counterintuitive for you in your life right now? So maybe it's to be patient in a situation where other people wouldn't be patient. Maybe it's to bite your tongue and be silent in a place where other people would be very vocal and just speak their mind. Maybe it's to not be upfront and draw attention to yourself in a place where the world might want to draw attention to itself. What's one value that God wants you to have in your situation right now that's counter intuitive, that feels backwards to the world? And third, third question, what's an area of peacemaking that you can take part in? What's an area of peacemaking that you can take part in? Maybe it's in a personal relationship, some kind of a brokenness, a mending of a relationship of your own. Maybe it's making peace in a community among people around you. Maybe there's some peacemaking, some shalom making that can be had in the community around you. So those three questions. I want to invite you to close your eyes um, for a time of reflection and silence. I'll repeat those three questions. I'll invite you to offer a prayer to the Lord, and then I'll close us in a time of prayer. So first was reflect on that place or those places in your life that ground you, remind you of your need for the Lord. Second, what's something that might be counterintuitive for you in terms of a value that you think God may want you to live out in your context? And finally, what might be an area where you can bring peace, God's peace? Father, we give you thanks for Jesus' words, his teaching in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, for his clear sightedness in seeing reality as it really is and teaching us about how to truly live. Lord, would you give us courage to swim against the stream of our culture, to do things in a different way, to be bold and courageous, to take steps of faith where it would be easier to do things according to the world's ways, according to even our own inclinations of our heart. Lord, would you give us courage to stand up against that? Give us courage to press forward on that steering wheel instead of pulling up to press into your kingdom to listen to your son Jesus help us Lord give us courage give us faith in Christ's name Amen
as we continue in worship through song, I'll invite the members of the prayer ministry team forward. I believe there will be some people in the front fireside room. Fireside room. Um, if you would like to pray with someone today. Uh, take a posture of sitting, kneeling, standing, whatever is uh, comfortable for you to continue reflecting um, and worship.
God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And as you become aware of all the places in your life where you need him, you need God, you need the Lord Jesus, may he fill you, may he be present to you. And as you follow him with courage, may you go with him into all those places where you can bring a sense of of his presence and be an ambassador for his kingdom. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Uh, before you guys
guys all scatter, I'm just going to say grace for us because you're all invited to the community potluck and uh, continue uh, fellowshipping and sharing and eating and, and socializing. So if I can just pray for us, I'll send you guys right on over, okay? Let's pray together. As soon as I have a moment of silence. Lord, we give you thanks for community, we give you thanks for food, we give you thanks for an ability to enjoy, enjoy each other's company in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for all the food that you provide to us. Thank you for your nourishment. Would you continue to be present with us as we talk, as we mingle, socialize, fellowship? Lord, bless us. Bless us as we bless the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you.